Hi folks, this is Marina Namchu and welcome back to my channel Prep Up with Marina. Today I am going to do a new chapter which is on page 25 in uh, The Echoes, a collection of ISC short stories. The chapter that I'm about to do is Quality and the author is John Galsworthy. So without wasting much time, let us now begin the chapter, which I will explain line by line, uh, wherever it is a little difficult. I knew him from the days of my extreme youth. Extreme means early youth, because he made my father's boots, inhabiting with his elder brother, two little shops let into one in a small by street a by street is uh, you know a street which meets a smaller street which uh, meets an uh, a bigger one now no more but then most fashionably placed in the west end so this is being told to us by the narrator that he knew someone somebody who made his father's boots from his early youth that tenement had a certain quiet distinction. The meaning of tenement is a building uh, which is uh, rented out to many tenants. So that tenement had a certain quiet distinction. There was no sign upon its face that he made for any of the royal family, merely his own German name of Jester Brothers. So there was no particular signboard which stated that, you know, he provided boots for the royal family, except that of the Jester brothers. Okay, the name Jester brothers was there. And in the window, a few pairs of boots. And in the window, um, he had displayed a few pairs of boots. I remember that it always troubled me to account for those unwearing boots in the window, for he made only what was ordered, reaching nothing down, and it seemed so inconceivable that what he made could ever have failed to fit. So, you know, he says, I remember that it always troubled me to account for those unwearing. Unwearing means uh, the boots which lacked variety, okay, uh, the boots that were in the window, for he only made what was ordered. He always took orders and he prepared the boots for his customers. And it seemed so inconceivable, inconceivable was impossible to imagine that what he made could ever have failed to fit because he was, uh, this person who made the boots, he was a perfectionist. And whatever he made, it fit the, the person who bought them perfectly. Had he bought them to put there, so, you know, the, the narrator, he's wondering whether those boots which he displayed on the window, whether he had bought it from somewhere to display it there. That too seemed inconceivable. Well, this idea also was something which he could not imagine. He would never have tolerated in his house leather on which he had not worked himself. So he would have never ever bought a commodity from somewhere else to keep it in his house because he could not tolerate it, tolerate somebody else's work in his shop. Besides, they were too beautiful, the pair of pumps, so inexpressibly slim. The pair of pumps, pumps is, you know, a pair of shoes that you just slip in. You don't, you don't need to tie lace and things like that. The patent leathers with cloth tops, the patent, patent means a glossy leather, making water come into one's mouth. The tall brown riding boots with marvelous sooty glow. Sooty glow, it was very black. As if, though new, as if those boots were just, you know, uh, made. They had been worn a hundred years. Those boots had been worn a hundred years. Those pairs could only have been made by one who saw before him the sole of boot. That means a person who could really understand uh, uh, the art of making boots so perfectly only could understand uh, you know, and uh, provide such boots. 
So truly were they prototypes, incarnating the very spirit of all footgear. These thoughts, of course, came to me later, though even when I was pro promoted to him at the age of perhaps 14, some inkling, some intuition haunted me of the dignity of himself and brother. So here we come to know that the narrator was later on when he was 14 years of age, he was introduced to uh, these uh, boot makers, these shoemakers. For to make boots, such boots as he made, seemed to me then and still seems to me mysterious and wonderful. So the narrator, you know, he's awestruck. He wonders how a person could ever produce such beautiful uh, handmade uh, boots. I remember well my shy remark one day while stretching out to him my youthful foot. So he had gone when he was very young to order a pair of boots. Isn't it awfully hard to do, Mr. Jessler? Isn't it hard to, uh, you know, make these uh, boots? And his answer, given with a sudden smile from out of the sardonic redness of his beard. Sardonic means mocking, all right? It is an art. That means it is an art. This is all he said. Himself, he was a little as if made from leather. With his yellow crinkly face, wrinkled up face, and crinkly reddish hair and beard, and neat folds slanting down his cheeks to the corners of his mouth. So he seemed to be elderly. And his guttural, guttural means, uh, you know, when you produce, produce a deep sound in your throat. And his guttural and one-toned voice. For leather is a sardonic substance, and stiff and slow of purpose. So he's being compared to the leather that he works on. And that was the character of his face, save that his eyes, which were grey-blue, and in them the simple gravity of one secretly possessed by the ideal. His elder brother was so very like him, so there were two of them, the watery, paler in every way, with a great industry, that sometimes in early days I was not quite sure of him until the interview was over. Then I knew that it was he. If the words, I will ask my brother, brother means brother, had not been spoken and that if they had, it was his elder brother. So, you know, there were two brothers. They were the Jester brothers. And the narrator, he tells us that he could not, he found it very difficult to differentiate between the two because they were so alike. When one grew old and wild and ran up bills, one somehow never ran them up with Jessler brothers. It would not have seemed becoming to go in there and stretch out one's foot to that blue iron spectacled glance, owing him for more than, say, two pairs. Just the comfortable reassurance that one was still his client. So the narrator says that, you know, most of the time people did not, um, you know, they were not in debt uh, with such uh, people like the Jester brothers. They normally paid up as soon as they got the uh, material from the Jester brothers. For it was not possible to go to him very often. His boots lasted terribly, having something beyond the temporary, some as it were, a sense of boot stitched into them. So, you know, uh, the narrator says here that once you took a, a pair of boots or pairs of boots from the Jester brothers, they normally didn't have to go back to them again because those boots used to last so very long. One went in, not as into most shops, in the mood of, please serve me and let me go. But restfully, as one enters a church and sitting on the single wooden chair, waited for there was never anybody there. So uh, uh, we are told once again that whenever people went into the Jester Brothers shop, they, uh, they didn't hurry, you know, they didn't rush things. They normally waited very quietly 
and as if they had entered a church and they had to wait for some time because uh, normally um, none of the two brothers would be there present. Soon, over the top edge of that sort of well dark, dark and smelling soothingly of leather which formed the shop, there would be seen his face or that of his elder brother peering down, that is looking down from up. A guttural sound and the tip-tap of bast slippers. Bast is something, it's a fiber, you know, um, that you get from certain trees. Uh, and the tip-tap of bast slippers beating the narrow wooden stairs and he would stand before one without coat, a little bent, in leather apron, with sleeves turned back, that means he must have been working, blinking, as if awakened from some dream of boots, or like an owl, surprised in daylight and annoyed at this interruption. So normally, as we have already discussed, uh, the customer had to wait for one of them to come down the steps and then only would they attend to the customer. And I would say, how do you do, Mr. Chesler? Could you make me a pair of Russia leather boots? Without a word, he would leave me retiring. Retiring means going back. Whence? Whence means from where he came. So, you know, uh, he never used to really respond when he was spoken to. And he would quietly go back to where he came from. Or into the other portion. Portion means part of the shop. And I would continue to rest in the wooden chair, inhaling the incense. Incense? of his trade. And what is the incense of his trade? The smell of leather. The soothing smell of leather as we had been told earlier. Soon he would come back holding in his thin veined hand a piece of gold brown leather. Uh, veined hand means you know hands that are marked with veins. Okay now he's an old man. You have to remember that. With eyes fixed on it he would remark what a beautiful piece. What a beautiful piece. When I too had admired it, he would speak again. When do you want them? When do you want them? And I would answer, oh, as soon as you conveniently can. And he would say, tomorrow for night. That means tomorrow after a fortnight. Or if he were his elder brother, his elder brother would say, I will ask my brother. Then I would murmur, thank you, good morning Mr. Jessler. Good morning, he would reply, still looking at the leather in his hand. And as I moved to the door, I would hear the tip tap of his bast slippers, restoring him up the stairs to his dream of boots. But if it were some new kind of footgear that he had not yet made me, then indeed he would observe ceremony, uh, divesting me of my boot and holding it long in his hand, looking at it with eyes at once critical and loving, as if recalling the glow with which he had created it and rebuking the way in which one had disorganized their masterpiece. So let's go back. But if it were some new kind of footgear that he had not yet made me, then indeed he would observe ceremony. That means uh, he would observe in a, uh, in a customary way. All right. Uh, divesting me of my boot. That means he would be taking in, you know, he would be looking at his boot and holding it in his hand uh, for a long time. All right. Looking at it with critical eyes, but loving eyes. And then he would actually be recalling how beautiful it had looked when it had been created. And now how disorganized, you know, um, the, piece of, uh, the, the piece of footwear looked. Then placing my foot on a piece of paper, he would two or three times stickle the outer edges with a pencil and pass his nervous fingers over my toes, feeling himself into the heart of my requirements. So the next thing he would do was, he would take a piece of paper, take a pencil, and then he would take the measurement of the narrator's foot, enjoying every moment of the work that he was doing, right? And also uh, realizing what were the requirements of the customer or 
the narrator. I cannot forget that day on which I had occasion to say to him, Mr. Jessler, that last pair of town walking boots creaked, you know. You know, there was a complaint. He made a complaint. He looked at me for a time without replying, as if expecting me to withdraw or qualify the statement, then said, it shouldn't have creaked. That means it shouldn't have creaked. It shouldn't have made that scraping sound that you are complaining about. It did, I'm afraid. The narrator, he insisted. No, it did creak. You got them wed before they found themselves. That means you got them wet. You got the shoes, the boots wet. I don't think so. The narrator says this. At that, he lowered his eyes as if hunting for memory of those boots. And I felt sorry I had mentioned this grave thing. You know, Mr. Jester just couldn't imagine that, uh, you know, he could have uh, made a mistake in producing uh, any pair of boots that would have creaked, you know. So, you know, he was thinking and he was trying to recall which pair of boots the narrator was actually talking about. And at this time, the narrator, he kind of regretted having complained about it. Send them back. Send them back. He said, I will look at them. I will look at them. A feeling of compassion. Compassion means a strong feeling of sympathy. All right. A feeling of compassion for my creaking boots surged up in me. Surged means it, it was aroused in him. So, well, could I imagine the sorrowful long curiosity of regard which he would bend on them. So, he knew very well that once Mr. Jester got those pairs of boots, you know, that uh, the narrator was complaining of, he knew that Mr. Jester would be bent over it, trying to find out what mistake, you know, he had made in producing that particular pair. Some boots, that is, some boots, he said slowly, are bad from birth. That is, from birth. If I can do nothing with them, if I can do nothing with them, I take him off your bill. I will take it off your bill. That means I will not take the money. Once, only once, I went absent-mindedly into his shop in a pair of boots bought in an emergency at some large firm. So one day, uh, you know, the narrator, he went into Jessler's uh, shop with a pair of boots which he had bought in another shop. All right. He took my order without showing me any leather and I could feel his eyes penetrating the inferior integument of my foot. Integument, the covering that uh, the, the pair of boots that he was wearing, which he had bought elsewhere. At last he said, those are not my boots. That means those are not, not my boots. I did not make them. So he could recognize his own piece of art. The tone was not one of anger nor of sorrow, not even of contempt. That means he did not even disrespect that piece, that uh, the pair of boots. But there was in it something quiet and froze the blood. But the way he said it, you know, the narrator felt a little awkward. He, he sensed something. He put his hand down and pressed a finger on the place where the left boot and Endeavouring, endeavouring means uh, looking or striving to be uh, fashionable, which, uh, you know, uh, looked fashionable, was not quite comfortable. So the pair of boots might have uh, been looking very fashionable. It might have been, you know, uh, the latest uh, uh, design, but it was actually not comfortable for the narrator. And Mr. Jester could immediately point out where it was, um, dis uh, where it was causing discomfort to the narrator. I hurts you there. It hurts you there. That means it hurts you there. He said, those big worms, that means those big firms have no self-respect. They have no self-respect. Drash. And then, as if something had given way within him, he spoke long and bitterly. You know, it seemed as if the dam just broke open. It was the only time I ever heard him discuss the conditions and hardships of his trade. They get it all. They get it all. 
Now, what is he talking about? They get it all, he said. They get it by advertisement, not by work. So what he's trying to say is all the other big firms, you know, they seem to be getting all their customers through advertisement and not through their hard work. They take it away from us. They take away all the customers from us who love our boots, who love our boots. Even those who love our boots, they are uh, kind of attracted uh, towards the other big firms because of the advertisement. It comes to this. It comes to this. Presently, I have no work. Presently, I do not have any work. No orders for boots. That's what he's trying to say. Every year, it gets less, you will see. Now, every year, the customers will get less. Our business will go down. That is what he's trying to say. And looking at his lined face, his wrinkled up face, I saw things I had never noticed before. Bitter things and bitter struggle. And what a lot of gray hairs there seemed suddenly in his red beard. Suddenly he realized Mr. Chester was really looking very old. As best I could, I explained the circumstances of the purchase of those ill-omened boots. You know, he tried to explain again, like why and how he had bought those pair of boots from the other firm. But his face and voice made so deep impression that during the next few minutes, I ordered many pairs. You know, the narrator started feeling sorry for Mr. Jessler. So he ordered for more pairs than he actually required. Nemesis fell. They lasted more terribly than ever. And I was not able conscientiously to go to him for nearly two years. So after this, uh, you know, after this, what happened was the narrator, uh, he could not actually meet Mr. Jester for two years after he bought the few pairs of boots. When at last I went, I was surprised to find that outside one of the two little windows of a shop, another name was painted, also that of a bootmaker, making, of course, for the royal family. So, you know, after two years, when he finally went, he found a different name outside the shop of the Chester brothers. And this name, you know, it, it was mentioned there that they were providing for the royal family, producing for the royal family. The old familiar boots, no longer in dignified isolation, were huddled in the single window. So the old pair of, remember the sooty leather boots? Well, it was all huddled. It was pushed to one corner of the window. Inside, the now contracted well of the one little shop was more scented and darker than ever. So when he entered, he found that the shop suddenly, you know, it was the scent was even more stronger than what it had been earlier. And it was longer than usual too before a face peered down and the tip tap of the bass slippers began. At last he stood before me and gazing through those rusty iron spectacles said, Mr. Isn't it? So he couldn't actually recall. Okay, so finally he did come after some much wait. Oh, Mr. Jester, I stammered, but your boots are really too good, you know. See, these are quite decent still. And I stretched out to him my foot. He looked at it. Yes, he said. People do not want good boots, it seems. But he looked at the boots and he says, but it seems people do not really want good boots. To get away from his repro reproachful Reproachful means no eyes, you know, uh, uh, that kind of uh, has criticism in them or, you know, um, an expression of blame in them, okay? To get away from his reproachful eyes and voice, I hastily, quickly remarked, what have you done to your shop? He answered quietly, it was too expensive. It was too expensive. Do you want some boots? So do you want some boots? It was too expensive to maintain the shop. That's what he's saying. I ordered three pairs. Though I had only wanted two, 
and quickly left. I had, I do not know quite what feeling of being part in his mind of a conspiracy against him, or not perhaps so much against him as against his idea of boot. One does not, I suppose, care to feel like that, for it was again many months before my next visit to his shop paid, I remember, with a feeling. Oh well, I can't leave the old boy, so here goes, perhaps it'll be his elder brother. So you know, uh, on uh, this visit that uh, we talked about, when he saw that a different name was on the board and not Mr. Chesler's, uh, he pairs, you know, uh, he, sorry, he buys, uh, he orders three pairs of boots and after that again, there's a lapse of time and he does not go back. And then he goes back again after quite a long time. And this time he thinks that he will probably meet his elder brother, the elder Jessler. For his elder brother, I knew, had not character enough to reproach me, to criticize him, okay, even dumbly. And to my relief in the shop, there did appear to be his elder brother handling a piece of leather. Well, Mr. Jessler, I said, how are you? He came close and peered at me. I am pretty well. I am pretty well, he said slowly. But my elder brother is dead. So... During this time when the narrator had not visited uh, the Jester brothers, the older one had died. And I saw that it was indeed himself, but how aged and wan. And never before had I heard him mention his brother. Much shocked, I murmured, oh, I'm sorry. So, you know, this time when he saw Mr. Jester, you know, he found him much older, you know, looking very, very old. And very weak. Yes, he answered. He was a good man. He made a good boot, but he is dead. And he touched the top of his head where the hair had suddenly gone as thin as it had been on that of his poor brother. To indicate, I suppose, the cause of death. He could not get over losing the other shop. So he could, my brother could not get over losing the other shop. Do you want any boots? Do you want any boots? And he held up the leather in his hand. It's a beautiful piece. He held up the leather and he said, it's a beautiful piece. I ordered several pairs. It was very long before they came, but they were better than ever. You know, he used to order and then once it was done, then finally uh, it used to be sent to him and then he, uh, the narrator used to go and pay up the bill, clear the bill. One simply could not wear them out. You just couldn't wear those shoes out. You know, it used to last so long. But, and soon after that, I went abroad. So after buying those pairs of boots, uh, those shoes, he went, he had to go abroad on some work. It was over a year before I was again in London. And the first shop I went to was my old friends. I had left a man of 60. I came back to one of 75, pinched and worn and tremulous. Tremulous? He was shivering, shaking, who genuinely this time did not at first know me. So, you know, he came back after a year and there was such a vast difference. Mr. Jessler, had, you know, he left a man of 60, all right? But when he came back, it appeared as if uh, Mr. Jessler had suddenly turned 75. So old he was looking. He was even shivering, shaking, all right? And then, and, it, uh, and he could not recognize the narrator at first. Oh, Mr. Jester, I said, sick at heart, how splendid your boots are. See, I've been wearing this pair nearly all the time I've been abroad, and they're not half worn out, are they? He looked long at my boots, a pair of Russia leather, and his face seemed to regain steadiness. Steadiness, some kind of uniformity. Putting his hand on my instep, he said, do they fit you here? Do they fit you here? I add, trouble with that bear. That means I had trouble with that pair, making that pair. I remember. I assured him that they had fitted beautifully. Do you want any boots? He said. I can make them quickly. It is a slack time. That means, you know, we're having less business. I'm having less business. So would you like to have any more boots? Business is not doing well. That's what he wanted to tell the narrator. I answered, please, please, 
I want boots all round, every kind, every kind of boot I want. I will make a fresh model. I will make a fresh model. This is what he said. Your food must be bigger. Your, your foot, your feet must have become bigger. That's what he's saying. And with utter slowness, he traced around my foot and felt my toes only once looking up to say, did I tell you my brother was dead? So did I tell you my brother was sick? That means, you know, he had forgotten that he had already mentioned it to the narrator that his brother had died. Well, those are my pets. They're on the watch. All right. So I continue. To watch him was painful. So feeble had he grown. So watching Mr. Jessler, it was very painful for the narrator because he realized how weak Mr. Jessler had become. I was glad to get away. I had given those boots up when one evening they came. You know, the narrator had almost kind of, um, uh, you know, given up the fact that those boots would arrive because it had taken a long time, okay? This time Mr. Jessler really took a long time to deliver them. Opening the parcel, I set the four pairs out in a row. Then one by one, I tried them on. There was no doubt about it. In shape and fit, in finish and quality of leather, they were the best he, e he had ever made me. And in the mouth of one of the town walking boots, I found his bill. The, the amount was the same as usual, but it gave me quite a shock. He had never before sent it in till quarter day. I flew downstairs and wrote a check and posted it at once with my own hand. So, sorry, this time when he finally did get the four pairs of boots that he had ordered earlier, one thing shocked him because in one of the, uh, the, the mouth of one of the boots, he found a bill, which normally Mr. Jester never used to send. All right. So the narrator immediately, uh, he realized his mistake that he should have, uh, he should have been prompt in, uh, you know, paying up. So he wrote out a check. A week later, Passing the little street, I thought I would go in and tell him how splendidly the new boots fitted. But when I came to where his shop had been, his name was gone. Still there in the window were the slim pumps, the patent leathers with cloth tops, the sooty riding boots. Those things, those articles were still there, but his name was not there. I went in very much disturbed. In the two little shops, again made into one, was a young man with an English face. Mr. Jessler in? I said. So the narrator asked for Mr. Jessler. He saw a new person, you know. He gave me a strange, ingratiating look. All right. So this English, uh, this person with an English face, he, he looked at uh, uh, the narrator wishing to gain some kind of a favor, okay, with that expression. No, sir, he said, no. But we can attend to anything with pleasure. We've taken the shop over. You've seen our name, no doubt, next door. We make, some, we make for some very good people. So Mr. Jester was nowhere in sight. And there was this new person who was there. And he was uh, trying to tell the narrator that they would be willing to take his order. Yes, yes, I said. But Mr. Jester, the narrator is still looking for Mr. Jester. And the man says, oh, he answered, dead. Dead? But I only received these boots from him last Wednesday e week. Ah, oh, he said, a shock and go. Poor old man starved himself. Good God, the narrator is shocked to know that Mr. Jester had starved himself to death. Slow starvation, the doctor called it. You see, he went to work in such a way would keep the shop on, wouldn't have a soul touch his boots except himself. When he got an order, it took him such a time. People won't wait. He lost everything. And there he'd sit, going on and on. I will say that for him. Not a man in London made a better boot. But look at the competition. He never advertised. Wouldn't have, would have the best leather. Sorry? would have the best leather too and do it all himself. 
Well, there it is. What could you expect with his ideas? So, uh, the narrator is totally shocked when he is informed that uh, Mr. Jester has starved himself to death. You know, he would, he is told uh, by this new person that Mr. Jester used to keep on working. He used to have the shop open till he finished his work. And he would work on the boots all by himself, on the shoes, you know, all by himself. He did not hire anyone and he had no machines to complete his work for him. And on top of that, he never advertised. And then he never gave, you know, he never gave uh, time uh, for himself. He was always at his work. But starvation, that may be a bit flowery, as the saying is, but I know myself he was sitting over his boots day and night to the very last. You see, I used to watch him. Never gave himself time to eat. So uh, Mr. Jester never took off, you know, to go and eat his meals. Never had a penny in the house. In fact, he didn't have money in the house. So maybe it was because he did not have money in the house. He did not have food in the house. All I went, sorry, all went in rent. All the money that he got, it went in rent, paying the rent and in leather. That is buying the leather for the boots. How he lived so long, I don't know. He, he regular let his fire go out. That means there were, there were many times when he did not even cook a single meal. He was a character, but he made good boots. boots. Yes, I said, he made good boots. And I turned and went out quickly, for I did not want that youth to know that I could hardly see. And why couldn't the narrator see? Because he had tears in his eyes when he realized how Mr. Jessler, how both the Jesslers had given up their lives because they were in poverty, despite the fact that they had the business of uh, making boots, making the best boots ever, but still, they did not have enough money to fend for themselves, to, you know, to make ends meet. So, this is the story about uh, the Jester Brothers, which is known as Quality, and which is rightly and aptly entitled by the author. So, with this, we come to the end of the chapter, boys and girls. I hope you have understood it. And I hope I have been able to explain it to you. Uh, you will have to uh, view my next uh, video in which I will be discussing a few more important points. So with that, boys and girls, bye-bye.